I've been preaching about healing for the hurting, and I'm going to continue that today, reading from Daniel chapter 3, verse 27. This is what God's Word says. It says, And the princes and governors and captains and the king's counselors being gathered together saw these men upon whose bodies the fire had no power. <laughs> nor was a hair of their head singed. Neither were their coats changed. Now get this. This jumped out at me years ago. It says, nor the smell of fire had passed on them. Now, 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 Now they had been in a fiery furnace, nor the smell of fire had passed on them. Well, well, get real, folks. You, you, you can't go in the Waffle House and that happen, amen? I mean, it's going to happen if you go in the Waffle House. You're going to come out smelling like smoke. But not them. They didn't, they, not the smell of fire had passed on them. Let us pray. Jesus, we love you. <laughs> I thank you for this day. I thank you, God, for your many blessings. Will you speak to us and through us? And... Uh, You're just so wonderful. You're so worthy to be praised. And we pray that the Holy Spirit of God would deal with people's hearts. And Jesus, may the invitation be fruitful. And I pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. I want to talk to you today about you're walking through hell, but how do you smell? You're walking through hell, but how do you smell? I was having a conversation with a a uh, mentor in my life, his name's R.T. Kendall. And I shouldn't have said this, but I did. It was a mistake. It's something I shouldn't have said. I said, R.T., everybody that I read after, R.T.'s written about 100 books. I said, everybody that I read after, R.T., is either dead or almost dead. He said, thank you, Benny. That's real encouraging. Matthew Henry, a preacher from days gone by, lived in the late 1600s, early 1700s. One day, Matthew Henry was robbed. I mean, he was, he was attacked. He was robbed. And that afternoon, he wrote some things in his journal. This is what Matthew Henry penned in his journal. He said, thank you, God, that I've never been robbed before. He said, second of all, Thank you that they did take my money, but they didn't take my life. He said, third of all, thank you, Lord, that they took my money, but they didn't take much. And he said, fourth of all, thank you, Lord, that it was I who was robbed and not I who robbed. What what are you saying, preacher? I'll tell you what I believe. I believe he walked through hell and he came out and he didn't smell like smoke. To quote the great theologian, Elvis Presley. (laughs) Elvis Presley said these words. He said, when things go wrong, don't go with them. When things go wrong, don't go with them. Now I want to get into our text and I want us to see some things today. The first thing I want you to quickly see is I want you to see the arrogance of the king the arrogance of the king. Preacher, who are you talking about? I'm talking about a man that was mentioned 90 times in the Bible. Certainly he plays a part. His name was Nebuchadnezzar. He was the first Gentile monarch. He ruled and reigned for 43 years. I mean, he was a conqueror. He conquered Assyria. He conquered Egypt. He conquered Judah. But his greatest feat of of accomplishment was he conquered Jerusalem. I want us to see some things about him. First thing I want you to see is this, folks. I want you to see the project. In verse 1, he said, I'm going to do something. He built an image, and this image was 90 feet tall. 90 feet tall by 9 feet wide. And according to Daniel 2 and 38, (laughs) he built an image, but it was an image of himself. This golden image, 90 feet tall. But notice, ladies and gentlemen, it was totally about him. 
We live in a world when if we're not very careful, folks, it quickly becomes totally about us. It quickly becomes about us. Literally, he built this image, the project. But, but I want you to see something else. That's in verse 1, but not only the project, but uh, I want you to see the politicians. Because if you look at verse 2, when he was going to dedicate this image, he invited them all. I mean, he, he invited the princes. He invited the governors. He invited the judges. Literally, he invited all the politicians to show up for the dedication. I wasn't even aware of this. Probably you're aware of this. This year in Washington, D.C., they had one of the coldest winters ever on record. One of the coldest winters ever on record in Washington, D.C. You say, Pastor Benny, how cold was it? Well, let me explain to you, folks. It was so cold this year, the politicians up there had their hands in their own pockets. <laughs> see, I want you to see, folks, I want you to see the project. I, I want you to see the politicians, but I want you to see the proclamation. Literally, Nebuchadnezzar said, now, uh, at this image that we're going to construct, he said, we're going to uh, construct this image and we're going to play music. And when people hear the music, they're going to bow down and they're going to worship this image. They're going to bow down and worship this image. He talked about it in verses three through five. So I quickly see the project, the politicians, the, the proclamation, but then I see something else, folks. I see the penalty. It's in verse six. Look what he said. And whoso falleth not down and worship the same hour, he'll be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. See, there was a, there was a penalty if you didn't fall down and worship the image. You say, Pastor Benny, does, does, how, how's this relevant to anything? Oh, it's futuristic. Because look what Revelation chapter 13, verse 15 says. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast. What's it saying? It's saying in the tribulation period, there'll be an image of the Antichrist. That the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast, they should be killed. Ladies and gentlemen, this is just a preview of what's going to happen in the future. Just a preview of what's going to happen in the future. Now look, I see the arrogance of the king, but I see something else. <laughs> I just had to throw this in. I see the antithesis of the Savior. The antithesis of the Savior. I, I, I see, look here folks, I, I, I see Nebuchadnezzar, this leader who was prideful, who said, look to me, who had to be the bride at every wedding or the corpse at every funeral. And then I see Jesus, who was the antithesis of this. See, I want you to understand something. The Bible never one time says pray for humility. You read it over and over. You can't find a verse where the Bible says pray for humility. But the Bible says this in James 4 and 10. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. You hear me closely, folks. Somebody said, I want to be like Jesus. Get this. Jesus described himself one time in the Bible. Somebody said, Jesus said he was love. No, John said he was love. Jesus said he was holy. No, Peter said he was holy. Jesus described himself one time in the Bible, ladies and gentlemen. He described himself in Matthew 11 and 29. He said, I am meek and lowly. I am meek and lowly. If we want to be a leader like Jesus, it won't be about bragging on ourselves. It will be through being humble. And you know, folks, uh, there's a such a thing as false humility. False humility. I, I heard about this concert singer one time who 
put on a concert, and Christian concert, and somebody came up to him and said, oh, brother, <laughs> that, was, that was good. And he said, oh, friend, it's all God. <laughs> and the guy said, it wasn't that good. <laughs> Because if it's all God, folks, it won't be good. It'll be incredible, amen? It'll be the best ever if it's all God. Now, now here's what I wanted to get you to see, folks. I've got to move, but I had to throw this in. The antithesis of the Savior. Well, well how, how did Jesus demonstrate humility? Well, it's in John 13, verse 3. Look what it says. Get this. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God. There, there's three things, folks. You say, Pastor Benny, I, I want to build humility in my life. I want to be like Jesus. Well, get this, folks. There's three things Jesus knew. First of all, Jesus knew where blessings come from. Jesus knew where blessings come from. Look, look, look what he said there in verse 3. He said, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands. The Father had given all things into his hands. Look at this one. I'm for working hard. But it's not our ability. It's not our hard work. Psalm 75 verse 6 and 7 teaches us that Promotion cometh neither from the east nor the west, <laughs> nor the south, but God is judge. He putteth down one and setteth up another. The only reason, folks, the only reason for power is to empower. Jesus knew, ladies and gentlemen, where his blessings came from, and it's so important that we understand where our blessings come from. Because if we don't, look, look, look here. If you don't turn it into praise, it becomes pride. If you don't turn it into praise, somebody ought to tweet that. What you don't turn into praise turns into pride. It's not about praising us. It's about lifting Jesus up. Get this. Jesus knew where blessings come from, but let me tell you something. Or something else. Jesus knew <laughs> where he came from. <laughs> Jesus knew where he came from. Look, look, look what he said. In. He said, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God. Let me tell you something, folks. We got to understand we got to understand where we came from. When I think about the Lord, how he saved me, how he raised me, how he filled me with the Holy Ghost, how he healed me to the uttermost. When I think about the Lord, how he picked me up and he turned me around, how he placed my feet on solid ground, it makes me want to shout, Hallelujah, Lord, you're worthy. Let me tell you something, folks. Somebody says, well, I've got more degrees than a thermometer. I'm proud for you, but I want to report to you, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. I'm sorry for getting excited. Jesus knew where blessings came from. Jesus knew where he came from. But let me tell you something else. <laughs> Jesus knew where he was going. Look what he said. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God, wait. And he went to God. Jesus said, bless God, I'm here for a mission, but I'm gonna go back to God. You know, I've never been one for a whole lot, to play a whole lot of games, but we used to play a board game. And uh, it was called Monopoly. And you know, you would buy all this stuff You'd buy these hotels and you'd buy motels. You, some of you played, you remember all that. But I had a thought one night. No matter how well you do, at the end of the game, it all goes back in the box. 
I, I've got a news flash for you. One day it's all going to go back into the box. Amen? And we're going to stand before God. See, 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 I see the arrogance of the king. I see the antithesis of the Savior. But look here. I see the assurance of the boys. <laughs> I, I, I see the assurance of the boys. You know, uh, I see two things. I, three things. I see the test. First of all, I, I see the test. I heard about an old boy that was playing football. See which team was. He was with the Georgia Bulldogs. And he wasn't real smart. And, and he found this kind of a nerdy guy in the class and he started copying off of him. One day they had a test, there was 10 questions and that old football player was looking over on that nerdy guy's paper and he verbatim copied his answers, one through nine. And he got down to verse 10, uh, question 10 and the, and, the, and, and the smart guy just didn't know the answer. And he just wrote, I don't know the answer. <laughs> and they handed in their papers, and they were verbatim just like nine questions verbatim. But on 10, when he said, I don't know the answer, the teacher thought this old boy was cheating. And then when she found his paper, he said, me neither, me neither. <laughs> Speaking of Georgia football, we got a Georgia football player coming, Carson Beck. He'll be here with us in a couple weeks. Now, now, now get this, folks. There, 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 there's a test. The, the, the king said, listen, we're, we're going to heat this fire. And if anybody does not bow down and worship this image, they're going to be cast into the fire. Now, when I was in school, we had a lesson and then we had a test. But you know what I've learned in life? There's a test that teaches you a lesson. You say, preacher, I'm going through a hard time. Well, let me tell you something. John 16 and 33 says, well, in this world, that, uh, in this world we're going to have tribulation. You're going to have hard times. But the good news is Jesus has overcome the world. Now, no, wait, I, I, I see the test, and, but then I want you to know something. I see the, the tribulations. You say, Pastor, what's the difference between a trial and a tribulation? I truly believe that a trial is short <laughs> and tribulation can be long. Amen. I believe a trial can produce patience in your heart, but a tribulation produces perseverance in your heart. Think about this, folks. The Bible says that He's the vine and we're the branches. And he said in John chapter 15, verses one through two, if a, if, a, if a branch doesn't produce fruit, he cuts it off. But he said so that it will produce more fruit, he prunes it. You know what that tells me, folks? It tells me either way, it's painful on the branch. See, I see the test, I see the tribulations, but I see the testimony. Look, look, look what these three Hebrews said. They said, if it be so, our God, whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. He will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, we'll not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. I love what they said. They said, the God we serve, he's able to deliver us. But even if he don't deliver us, we just want to remind you, we're not going to bow down and serve your image. What were they saying? They said, God, I want you to touch my body of this cancer. But Lord, even if you don't touch my body of this cancer, I'm going to live for you. God, my wayward child's a thousand miles away. And Lord, I want you to send them back. But even if you don't send them back, I'm going to live for you. God, I want you to touch my wife. But even if you don't touch my wife, I'm going to live for you. God, I want to get that new job. But even if I don't get that job, I'm going to live for you. Somebody said, well, preacher, why didn't God deliver them out of the fire? Here's a principle I've learned. Sometimes he don't deliver you out of the fire. He delivers you in the fire. And what we fail to realize when we're going through a hard time, 
we ought to do just what these three Hebrews did. These three Hebrew children, in Daniel chapter 2, verses 17 and 18, they just prayed to God. They just prayed to God. And folks, when you pray to God, God works. Amen? When you pray to God, God works. I, I pastored the church here 34 years. And I've had more transitions with staff probably in the last year than I ever have in 34 years. Because really, I try to hire people to retire people. I, I want them to stay with me, but sometimes it doesn't work out. So, so we've, had some, we've had some transitions. And there's one, one part of our ministry we were looking to, to put a guy in another position. And he said to me, I've got a young man to take my position. And I said, okay. And I said, let me meet with him. So Wednesday, we were going to meet about 10 o'clock. And about 15 to 10, folks, I knew I was going to meet with this young man. I knew that he went to a, a, a college. I knew he played baseball at that college. But I, I, I knew I was going to meet with him. So I walked into this sanctuary. And I said, God, you don't have to do this. But I really wish you would help me with something. And what happened the day before, there was a man who came to see me who was having some struggles. And I tried to help him. I said, I'm not a counselor, but I tried to help him. And, and, and by the way, don't, don't call me for counseling. If I was suicidal, I wouldn't see myself. My philosophy is admit it, quit it, and forget it. I'm just not a good counselor. I'm not, we got an entire wonderful counseling department. All my degrees are in theology. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not your man. You, you need somebody that's trained in that arena. I'm trained, and believe it or not, I'm trained to preach. I know that takes some of you back. <laughs> but, but a man came to see me the day before, and he, I, I talked with him, and he said, I want to give you something. I said, what is it? He handed me a baseball bat. And I said, uh, it's, it's cracked. He said, Benny, you don't understand. He said, Brian McCann was, was batting, and he broke this bat. I said, oh. He said, I paid a lot of money for it. And he said, I want to give it to you. Here's a certificate of authenticity. I said, that's neat. Tuesday afternoon, I stuck it in my restroom there in my office. And Wednesday morning, I'm praying. And I said, God, there's a young man coming to see me. And if it's your will for him to be here to work with us, he's 22 years old. I'm going to ask him, who's your favorite baseball player? And if he says Brian McCann, I'm going to give him the bat. I don't want to, but I am God. And that little young man was in my office. And I said, Mac, who's your favorite baseball player? He said, well, preacher, it's a guy from a day's gone by. I said, what's his name? He said, Brian McCann. <laughs> I looked at two of my staff members that was in the office. I said, you all can finish the interview from right here. God's already showed me this man is to work with us. Look, folks, look here. All I'm trying to say, when you don't know what to do, pray and talk to God. When you don't know what to do, grab hold of the horns of the altar. When you don't know what to do, keep seeking him. When you don't know what to do, grab the hem of his garment. Amen? Amen. Folks, I see the arrogance of the king, the antithesis of the Savior, the assurance of the boys. But wait, I want you to see the astonishment of the king. <laughs> the astonishment of the king. It's in verses 24 and 25. Look here. That old king, old King Nebi, looked down there and he said, uh, didn't we cast three men into the fire? They said, oh, we did. Nebi said, I'll see a fourth one. And he's likening to the Son of God. I wish I'd been there. I'd said, Nebi, come up real close. He's not like the Son of God. He is the Son of God. He's Jesus, the Lamb of glory. Now you say, wait, preacher. Wait, preacher. The fourth man, he's in the fire. You said, Pastor, I'm, I, I'm going through a hard time right now. Where's Jesus? He's in the fire with you. The Bible says the three Hebrew children, it never says they saw him. But ladies and gentlemen, he was in the fire with them. 
Today you may be going through a hard time, a difficult time, and you may not see him, but I want you to know he's not a feeling anyway. He's a fact, and he's in the fire with us when we're going through tough times. Now get this, I'm almost done. I see the fourth man, but I see the fire miracle. <laughs> it's in verse 27, they come out of the fire and they didn't even smell like it. The problem folks, many times we go through things today, but the resentment, the bitterness, the anger, the malice, the unforgiveness, the hurt, the shame, is still there. We walk through hell, but we still smell like hell. We walk through hell, but we still smell like hell. And you're still talking about what happened to you. But they walked through hell and they came out and they didn't smell like smoke. Two monks came to a body of water one time and there was a beautiful woman there that was trying to cross the river. And one monk, he could tell that beautiful woman was scared. He picked her up, put her on his shoulder, carried her across the river. They walked for a few hours. And finally, after a few hours, the one monk said to the other monk, we're not supposed to touch women. We're not supposed to touch women, but you did. And the monk said, yes, I did. I picked her up, I carried her across the river, and I laid her down. But he said, you're still carrying her. When are you gonna let go of that hate? When are you gonna let go of that bitterness? When are you gonna let go of that malice? When are you gonna let go of that unforgiveness? When are you gonna get let go of that strife? When are you gonna let go of that self-esteem being tried, being tied to what people think of you publicly? Oh, you, 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 you're, you're walking through hell. You say, I got on the other side. No, no, you didn't get on the other side because everybody around you can tell you still smell like smoke. Goodness gracious, goodness gracious. Now look here, folks. If you look at verse 20 of the text, they, they put them in, I, I, I gotta quit. They put them in the fire and they were bound. They were bound. But look, if you look at verse 25, they were loose. I may just run down that center aisle. Listen, they were loose because they left it in the fire. They left what was binding them in the fire. Oh, I don't know who I'm preaching to, but when are you going to leave it in the fire? When are you going to let go and let God? When are you going to leave it in the fire? Uh, uh, let, let me give you one more illustration. I've got to hurry, but I've, I've got to quit. I've got to quit. In Acts chapter 28, look what it says. And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a snake out of the heat and fastened on his hands. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hands, they said unto themselves, no doubt this man is a murderer whom through, though he had escaped the sea, vengeance suffer him not to live. And he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. You say, preacher, how do you feel about snake handling? We need to put them in the fire. <laughs> Silly, put them in the fire. It, it grabbed hold of his hand. Look here, folks. It grabbed hold of his hands and he put it in the fire. But wait, 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 I'm almost done. Look what verse seven and eight says. In the same quarters were possessions. The chief man of the island, whose name was Publius, who received us and lodged us three days courteously. And it came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of fever and of, of bloody flux. 
to whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands upon him and he healed him. Get this, folks. Laid his hands. He had to put the snake in the fire before God could use his hands to lay on a man. Some of you are wanting God to use you. You got to put some things in the fire before God can use your hand. You say, I want him to answer this prayer. I want him to answer that prayer. You're going to have to put some things in the fire before God can use your hands. Let's stand to our feet. I'm sorry. Every head's bowed and every eye's closed. Preacher today, the message unequivocally was for me. Hold your hand up high. Hands all over this building. Hands all over this building. I wonder if there one would say, Preacher, I'm here today and I don't know that if I died, I'd go to heaven. I don't, I don't know that if I died, I'd go to heaven, Preacher Benny. And, and, and I just want you to pray for me. I just, you won't call my name or embarrass me. I will not. But Brother Benny, I want you to pray for me. If you'd like for me to pray for you, just slip your hand up. Pray for me, preacher. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. I'm waiting on your hand today. I don't know that I'm right, preacher, but I want you to pray for me. Listen closely. If you raised your hand that you don't know you're right with God, if you raised your hand, you don't know you're right with God, repeat this prayer with me right where you're standing. Pray it right where you're standing. Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner, but God, I'm sorry for my sin. I'm so sorry I want to change. I believe that you died on the cross for my sin, and I confess them to you right now. Come into my heart, Lord. Come into my life and forgive me. Thank you, God, for forgiving me. Thank you for coming into my life. Pastor, I prayed that prayer with you. Hold your hand up real high where I can see it. God bless you. God bless you in the back. I I prayed that prayer with you. Hold your hand up real high where I can see it. 